Inside these high walls, street gangs are roaming out of control. But things aren't all they seem. The razor wire and electric fences that keep certain intruders at bay surrounds a luxury golfing estate in South Africa. A 500-acre man-made Eden called Mount Edgecombe. And the gangs, vervet monkeys, primates with attitude. The resident Pani troop jealously guard their prized territory. But from across the border, the rougher, tougher sugarcane gang wants a slice of the action. Turf war looms as they head in for a hostile takeover bid. Can Pani leaders Bess and Brains rally the troops and hold on to their Mount Edgecombe home? Or will the battle-hardened sugars wrench paradise from Pani hands? It's mating season in Mount Edgecombe. The power struggles between the males of the Pani troop are savage and unrelenting. <laughs> Status determines mating rights, and as alpha male, Brains gets plenty of girls. He's ascended to the apex of vervet society, but he needs to be on his guard. It's every Pani male's dream to stand in Brains' shoes at mating time. Popularity with the ladies is also key to male power, and the ambitious Mr. Cool has his eye on the top job. He could never be accused of being shy, and he's been trying some fancy moves with the Pani girls. Newcomer Robbie also wants in on the action, and has his eye on the greasy pole of vervet power. Brains had better watch his back. While the Pawnee males obsess about sex and power, it's the girls who get on with the uh, important jobs, like raising families and defending the turf. But some challenges are so serious that the females can't deal with them alone. And as winter approaches, the troop needs to pull together. The rival sugarcane gang are massing on Mount Edgecombe's borders. These out-of-town roughneck vervets want in on the Pawnee's turf, and this time, they mean business. <laughs> Queen of the Turf is Bess, formidable leader of the 28-strong Pani troop and vervet in chief of the coveted Mount Edgecombe estate. A rare slice of primate heaven in a frenetic world. Bordered by treacherous highways and never-ending development, Mount Edgecombe is an oasis of vervet-friendly habitat in a desert of human expansion. For primates, man and monkey, life doesn't get much better than this. Although for the humans on the estate, there's a fly in the ointment. Vervets. Passed from mother to daughter, this territory has been in Bessie's family for generations. Her ancestors foraged here long before this was turned into a golfing estate. The sisterhood expect to spend their entire lives here. It's a home worth holding on to rich in natural foods and exotic side dishes, it's vervet living at its finest and a safe place to raise a family. For the Pani girls, home and family are everything, and the Edgecombe vervets seem to have it made. Vervets on the outside don't have it nearly so easy. 
Beyond the borders of Mount Edgecombe, every piece of land that hasn't been built on has been cleared and given over to the growing of sugarcane. But vervets are nothing if not adaptable. Even in this wilderness, they can scratch a living, as the neighboring streetwise sugarcane gang have proved. With the sugarcane harvest nearly over, a major food source is about to disappear. And that's not all. Unlike the Pani Troops' Mount Edgecombe home, this is no sanctuary. Crop raiding vervets are seen as vermin and are not protected by the law. Faced with food shortages and surrounded by danger, the desperate sugarcane gang want out. And it seems they've set their sights just across the highway. The Mount Edgecombe Golf Clubhouse is a favorite hangout for human and monkey alike. A wedding party is all about pilfering prospects. The vervets are not on the guest list, but can always be relied upon with the mopping up. As usual, middle-ranking party girl Halftail is near the front of the line. As a young female with no infant to worry about, she can afford to take risks and is always in on the raiding action. With such an abundance of leftovers, the Pani sisterhood are in the peak of health, and there's no shortage of males trying to impress. Unlike the girls, a male may move troops several times in his life, ever on the lookout for new mating opportunities. Mount Edgecombe is a honeypot. Get your feet under the table here, and you could have it made. But competition for membership of the Pani Club is fierce, and Bess is a very discerning leader. For an outsider like Robbie, all this bounty must seem like manna from heaven. As a Pani troop hopeful, Robbie's been watching from the sidelines for long enough. If he wants to make it as a member of the troop, he must first win round the girls. But gaining their trust takes time. He must choose his moments carefully. He can't risk drawing too much attention from the higher ranking males. This calls for a delicate approach. Something that mid-ranking Mr. Cool fails to grasp. Subtlety isn't Mr. Cool's middle name. And overt social climbing, like soliciting the affections of top female Bess, is a fast track to the wrong side of alpha male brains. It's Brain's job to remind the other Pani males of their place. But a monkey of Brain's snatcher and confidence doesn't need to throw his weight around. An assured broadsiding display sends the message loud and clear. It's enough to put Cool smartly in his place. Brain's has made his point. A chastised cool takes out his frustration trying to psych out a pair of Egyptian geese. The geese seem less than impressed. Robbie takes all this in from a distance. A softly, softly approach is more his style. It's a wise monkey who bides his time.
With the Pali females in season, lone male Tyson is also sniffing around the fringes of the troop. With a reputation as an aggressive anti-social monkey, Tyson's forceful strategy is a million miles from Robbie's cautious tactics. Prime suspect in a series of violent infant attacks, Tyson found himself at the rough end of Piney justice and was left fighting for his life. But Tyson's one tough monkey. After treatment, he escaped from the monkey feeding and rehab center run by Lynette Weber. Tyson was last seen limping across the 14th fairway to freedom. Tyson's always been the toughie and he's been um, terrorizing the monkeys around here. He's bitten off tails and um, being a tough guy like that, being a lone male, you know, that, that increases their chances as well. And I'm sure he'll be terrorizing everyone again by next week. <laughs> so we have to just try and find him and monitor him for the next few days. I think if he's fine in the next three days, um, we should leave him and he'll get on with it. Lynette puts on a brave face. Tyson may be tough, but the streets are no place for an injured monkey. If infection from his wounds doesn't get him, there's plenty else out there that could. Suspected as a baby killer, Tyson's not a popular figure. For a wandering male, infanticide is one way of bringing females into season quickly. A chance of a sneaky mating. But it can backfire, as in Tyson's case, bringing the whole troop down on him like a ton of bricks. Tyson's used to fending for himself, but his wounds make him a soft target. But if Tyson's not welcome in Mount Edgecombe, where else can he go? In his weakened state, Tyson would never survive in the harsh outside world. Even the street mean sugarcane gang are moving on. And they're all set for a morning raid on the Piney Troop's prized turf. Oblivious to the scheming sugarcane gang just across the way, top Piney girl Bess has no idea how events are about to unfold. Her concerns lie with a threat closer to home. Tyson's back. He's managed to fend off infection and seems to have decided to stay. Perhaps he's grown tired of being the outsider. But will the Parnies want him? Bess rules the roost. She decides who's in and who's out. Tyson seems to know he won't be received with open arms. For now, he must content himself by looking on from a safe distance. Top male brains will also have something to say about Tyson's reappearance. He doesn't need another wannabe muscling in on his reproductive rights. There are more than enough males jockeying for power lower down in the Pani ranks. But while it would take a brave monkey to challenge the leader, there are any number of males who could make a bid for Cool's spot at number two. Cool needs to be proactive if he isn't to find himself slipping down the charts. As a rookie member of the Pani troop, Robbie can only aspire to the lofty heights of Brain's position, or even Cool's but he has been making headway with the females, grooming them and playing with the kids. He's increasing in popularity and becoming a fixture within the troop. Cool needs to safeguard his position 
He can't afford to let Robbie get ideas above his station. A dominance display should put Robbie in his place. Robbie doesn't have the self-assurance to rise to Cool's challenge, and he's not keen to antagonize his superior. He lip smacks in submission. Cool flaunts his stomach, and the brisk tap to Robbie's head drives his message home. Cool's superiority is clear. Pony girl Lucy watches from the sidelines. An assertive male is an attractive male, and Cool seems to be brimming with confidence. This is pure intimidation. The longer Cool keeps up the pressure, the more stressed Robbie will become. At last, Cool seems to have lost interest. Robbie risks a subtle display of his own. But this isn't going to convince Cool of anything, especially if Cool isn't even looking. Lucy's taking it all in, but it's not the assertive Mr. Cool that she heads for. She's got her eye on Robbie. Whatever Robbie has done to win Lucy's favor, this vote of confidence is an important boost and will shore up his position within the troop. But in the end, it's alpha female Bess who calls the shots. Where she goes, the rest of the gang follow. Like all the Pali females, Bess has learned the location of every fruiting tree on her turf and every opportunity for a free lunch. They're heading to Twin Palms for a gourmet-style buffet. Twin Palms is the jewel in the crown of the Pani's turf, with more sugar-rich fruit than a verbit could dream of. The feeding station provides Robbie with an up-to-date snapshot of the male hierarchy. Alpha male Brains is first in line for any handouts. Next, Mr. Cool takes his place on the power ladder. There's even enough for a gawky kid like Wingnut. Low-ranking Ben hasn't even got a look in yet. Enough homework, time for a banana. Robbie needs to bulk up fast if he's to prove a worthy opponent to the likes of Brains. And getting into shape is a sure way to catch the eye of the Pani females. The Pani's are busy stuffing their faces. They're not paying attention. They're being observed by the out-of-town sugarcane gang. The whole gang have sneaked into the estate, and they've got their eye on the Pani's pie. Gizmo, a high-ranking sugar male, weighs up the competition. If his gang could take Lynette's, they'd be set up for life. But the Parnies are there in full force. Are the Sugars bold enough to take them on? Gizmo certainly thinks so. He's on the move. The Parney troop haven't spotted him yet, and now he's got backup. The entire gang are heading in. Finally, the Parnies are onto them. 
The trees are full of sugars. They've got the party surrounded. Mr. Cool takes a frontline position. Robbie too. A warm reception was never on the cards for Gizmo. Everyone's hyped and aggressive. But in the confusion, it's his own troop who takes a swipe at him. Bess and Halftail stand firm. Twin Palms is irreplaceable. They can't risk giving an inch. The Piney Troop are not backing down. Faced with such strong opposition, the intruders have no option but to beat a retreat. Without the backing of his gang, even Gizmo's forced to give up. Twin Palms is safe. Round one to the Pani troop. But having sampled the Pani's paradise, the Sugarcane gang are hardly likely to head back home. Bolstered by his place on the winning team, Robbie's full of himself. He's done his groundwork with the females. It's time to start his journey up the male power ladder. He needs to prove to the ladies that he can dominate other males, that he's an assertive monkey. He heads for low-ranking Ben, settling down for some R&R with Lena. Ben's terrified. Robbie's made his point and doesn't need to hammer it home, but Lena's still close by. If Robbie's to secure mating opportunities, he needs females to switch their allegiance. A quick broadside display and some head bobbing can't hurt. Robbie's small triumph marks a turning point in his career. Another step towards a future within the troop. But across the fairway, lone male Tyson is still very much on the outside. He's still shadowing the troop, but will he risk getting any closer? The Parnies retire to their clubhouse, still decked out after the recent wedding. The tablecloths make for a good game of hide-and-seek for the juveniles. Ever-resourceful half-tails bagged herself a discarded bottle of chilli sauce. Bit of an acquired taste, though. The infants have spotted something. Best too. It's Tyson. But what does he want? The juveniles are more interested in their game. Their memories are short. They don't seem to connect the recent attacks on their number with this distant figure. Bess keeps an eye on Tyson. As the prime suspect of infanticide, he cannot be trusted. Tyson's moving in. The youngsters are still oblivious. Bess isn't the only one watching. Cool's clocked him too. Tyson makes his move. Clueless to the threat, the infants welcome him with open arms. And against all expectations, he's playing. Is this a new, softer Tyson? 
Cool's not convinced. Nor are Bess and Brains. Aggression didn't get Tyson very far. Being nice to the infants rather than attacking them could just be another way of getting to the Pani females and securing a mating. Bess needs to put a stop to this, and she's got Brains as backup. This is not the reception Tyson was hoping for. <laughs> If he doesn't get in with a gang, Tyson will never get a piece of the female action. He needs to try another tactic. Tyson's not one to be put off. He's keen for a second stab at the regular member of the gang thing. One of the infants is in trouble. The vervets take to the safety of the roof, but not Tyson. He holds his ground, the only monkey prepared to stand up to a human. youngsters free. Tyson can relax. Protecting the infants is one way of proving to the females that he's not such a bad guy after all. That he's good to have around. Useful even. His heroism hasn't gone unnoticed. Bess has been watching. Although Tyson may have done some pretty bad things, he's just demonstrated a very different side to his character. With the sugarcane gang snapping at the Pani's heels, Tyson's brawn could come in handy. Brains asserts his authority. Okay, Tyson can stay, but he'd better toe the line. The Parnies have once again taken their eye off the ball. They're under surveillance from the clubhouse car park. It's the tireless gizmo again. But after their recent defeat, would the Sugars really risk another attack? Bess looks on in alarm as the entire sugarcane gang spill across the park. Cools onto them too. Tyson watches from a distance. His wounds are still fresh and held together by sutures. He can't risk a fight, not even for the sake of his newfound brethren. Juveniles bring up the rear of the invading column. They've reached the island, right next to the Pani's clubhouse. This is no advance party. The whole gang are here. The Pani girls rush forward on the defensive. Cool's there too. Robbie hangs back on the sidelines, his newfound confidence deserting him. The Sugars surge forward. Bess and Halftail launch a counter-attack. The Sugars come back, not looking so confident. The Pani seize the advantage and push forward again. They're gaining ground.
cooled struts assertively. He's more interested in keeping the Pawnee females away from those sugar cane males than defending the troop. Finally, the sugars retreat. Cool swaggers in victory. The island and the clubhouse are still theirs. But Bess's alarm call cuts across the Pawnee complacency. The sugars are going nowhere. Behind the island, they're still hyped and ready to fight. It's not clear what finally tips the balance in the Battle of the Flower Bed. Perhaps it's the failure of the males to support the Pawnee girls. But the Sugars have emerged as the stronger side. Bess and the females have no option but to retreat. And the Sugars move in to claim their prize, the Pawnee's treasured clubhouse. With a Sugar stronghold deep within Pawnee turf, life on the estate is set to change forever. Driven from their clubhouse, the map of Pawnee life has been radically redrawn. But the Pawnee troop can still find safety and solace right at the heart of their patch. Plantation House and the adjacent Pawnee Bush were once the centre of a thriving sugarcane estate. Now, the dilapidated house with its neglected grounds are all that remain. It's a place where world-weary vervets can recharge and regroup. No raiding opportunities here, though. The Pawnees return to a more natural diet, wild fruiting trees scarce elsewhere on the estate. This is where young vervets can explore and learn where through play they take their first steps towards establishing their standing within the group. The females by birth and the males through merit. This embryonic troop in the making will form the heart of Pawnee society in years to come. Tyson has shown up. Cool keeps an eye on him. The playful atmosphere is infectious and attracts an unusual playmate, a blue diker, one of Africa's smallest antelope. Tyson too has caught the mood and seems to be settling into his new role as everyone's favourite uncle. If this is a tactic, it seems to be working. With the sugarcane gang massing on the estate's border, Plantation House is a safe haven far removed from the gathering clouds that the Pawnee troop must one day face. There's a storm on the way. Rare at this time of year. Freak storms are known for their ferocity and can wreak havoc on the estate. This just isn't the Pawnee's day. 
and it's going to be a long night. Early morning brings a changed landscape. The Pawnee troop haven't slept much. The storm has redrawn the map even further. Buildings all round the estate are damaged, but that's not all. The grounds of Plantation House have been devastated. Many of the Pawnee's familiar haunts and favourite roosting trees are gone. This is a world turned upside down. With the clubhouse now in sugarcane gang hands, the Pawnee troop are running out of options. At least there's one place at the heart of their patch that can't have changed, where the cold and hungry Pawnee troop are guaranteed a warm welcome, Twin Palms. But the Pawnees are stopped dead in their tracks. Something is wrong. The sugarcane gang are blocking the entrance. Bess warns the troop, Twin Palms is crawling with sugars. The sugar boss, the massive Big Daddy, is on guard duty. This is not looking good. He sounds the alarm. Gizmo's there too. He yawns, but there's nothing sleepy about Gizmo. Brains ventures closer. Sure enough, the entire sugarcane gang are getting stuck into breakfast. Best chatters with rage. The Pawnees gather to assess their options. The tables have been dramatically turned. It's now the sugarcane gang with the advantage. Bess climbs for a better look. She's out on a limb and dangerously close to the opposition. But this is her territory, her birthright. And she's not giving it up without a fight. The sugar boss is poised for action. Brains moves back. He doesn't want to risk injury. But bold young Halftail refuses to be put off. 
One of the juveniles follows her lead. She's taking a massive risk. They could turn on her at any moment. The sugar boss is onto her. Halftail beats a hasty retreat, but the sugar boss pursues her. Other sugar canes weigh in. They've staked their claim and aren't about to let go. To Lynette, all vervets are equal. She can't get involved in monkey politics or take sides. Bess alarms, but it's too late. They're surrounded. Many females put up a brave fight, but it's no use. The pressure's too much. The Parnies are on the run. First the clubhouse, now Twin Palms. Both have fallen to sugarcane rule. The entire heart of the Pawnee's world now lies in sugarcane gang hands. With no safe place left, the gang are forced north to the furthest corner of their range. The Pawnees, exiled from the Eden that was their home, must adapt to survive and find new territory. Nothing unknown for a fresh recruit like Robbie, or even a Pawnee veteran like Cool. As males, they are used to exploring new horizons. But for Bess and the sisters who stay loyal to the troop for life, their home is their world. Away from their patch, they're less confident, vulnerable. Being down on your luck means making your living where you can. One primate's trash is another's picnic. From riches to rags in a few short days. It's all a bit of a come down for Queen Bess. Across the estate, the sugarcane gang tuck into the spoils of war. Twin Palms gourmet meals are now just a sweet memory for the Pawnee girls. Low-ranking Lucy's used to life near the bottom of the pile. In the recent reversal of fortunes, her trash raiding skills could be coming into their own. If there are pickings to be had, Lucy will sniff them out. Lucy struck gold. Brains is on the scrounge too, but something's distracted him. It's Tyson, and he's got some serious booty. Circumstances may have changed, but the pecking order hasn't. As top male, what Brains wants, Brains takes. And squealing like a baby isn't going to change that. With so much in flux, alpha male Brains is now sensitive to the slightest hint of a challenge. Changing times bring changing fortunes and spell new opportunities for ambitious vervets. Brains must constantly reaffirm his leadership. High-ranking Cool, for one, is prone to throwing his weight around. Brains reminds him who's in charge.
But while Cool seems increasingly shaky in his position at number two, newcomer Robbie is growing in stature. For a male vervet, what you do today defines who you are tomorrow. And Robbie asserts himself with almost casual ease. Even Tyson's gaining acceptance. Bess seems quite happy to hang out with the old bully. Never still for long, the Pawnee troop head out along the northeastern fringes of their known turf, bordering the Greenbrier estate, home to other vervets. Once again, the Pawnees are being watched. But these are no sugars. The Pawnees have strayed onto the turf of a whole new gang. It's the Pawnees who are now the invaders. And in this neck of the wood, they have no advantage. The Pawnees must sight themselves up. Brains weighs the opposition. But out of nowhere, it's Robbie who launches himself towards the unknown gang. With the old rulebook out of the window, it's his chance to show what he's made of. It's a bold monkey who sees opportunity in adversity. Brains is with him. Together with the females, they face the enemy. But the locals are standing firm. This is their turf, and they're determined to ensure that the Pawnees are just passing through. In vervet politics, discretion is always the better part of valor. The Pawnees move on. But for one vervet, this encounter was far from a shameful defeat. Robbie's recent display of courage has subtly tipped the internal order within the exiled group. He now has the confidence to broadside the higher-ranking cool in a very clear challenge. Robbie moves off, not even allowing cool the right of reply. Having the bottle to snub a monkey like cool is testament to Robbie's newfound confidence. Cool's position, on the other hand, is looking increasingly tenuous. With the heart of their territory in enemy hands and the periphery too dangerous and politically sensitive to linger around for long, the Pawnee troop must find a new home. If top-ranking Brains is to hold on to power, he needs to act fast. Only one option remains. Brains takes the fate of the entire troop in his hands. Braving the electric fences and unfamiliar roads, he leads the troop out of the Mount Edgecombe estate, beyond the security of their home range and onto unknown turf. Bess and the rest of the troop follow close behind. Life beyond Mount Edgecombe's borders is no picnic. Crawling with unknown vervet gangs and hostile humans. Brains is leading the troop towards an uncertain future. Can they survive outside their comfort zone, far removed from all that they know? Only by uniting through the common bonds that hold the group together will they overcome their current crisis. Tomorrow is always another day.